about Am I Coming Through? That is the title of this week's sermon, Am I Coming Through? We have to ask ourselves sometimes, are we being heard? And sometimes we have to ask ourselves, is the person who's trying to communicate with me being heard? It's a two-way street. We like to talk. We like to be heard. But are we really listening to the person who's trying to communicate to us? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Am I coming through? Now, the church has been described in three ways that I've heard. And the description is kind of to describe our purpose and who we are. So the first one is, we are a place of refuge. We are a place where if someone's hurting and needs safety, they can come to. The second one is, we are a place of hope. So if you're lost and you have no direction, the church is a place to find direction and hope. But the third one I like best, we are a hospital. That should describe us 100%. Because we're not here for the healthy. It's good that the healthy attend because the healthy are like nurses and doctors to the sick. But we were called to go to the sick. We were called to go to those who were lost, who are without hope, who are without refuge, we are to bring that to them. We are the ambassadors for Christ. So, we are an emergency room a lot of the times. We are an immediate fix for people. But we are <coughs> called to be the hospital. Now that's going to come with some issues for us. When we look at a refuge, we have to have love to be a refuge, right? We have to have it. Because... When we open our doors up to people, people are going to come in and they're going to look at us and say, I don't like you going. I don't, I don't want to be around you guys. But we open up our doors and say, we're loving you. We want to love you. And they'll come in and they'll scorn us for that. So we have to have love enough to say, I'm willing to open those doors up to be a refuge. I'm willing enough to open up myself to be a refuge for someone who needs the love of Christ. They can come to me. We also have to have love to offer hope. Because people are going to come in and they're going to be a part of us for a little bit and then they're going to walk away. But we have to have love in our hearts to say, I want to give you the hope that I have. I want to show you the hope I have. I want to offer you the hope that I have. And we can't just go, hey, I'm going to put myself out there and, and talk about Jesus and not have love to some, for someone. Because we're not going to do it if we don't. If we don't have love for the lost... We're not going to be willing to go out there and say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the hope I have. And a hospital, that's the hardest thing. That's the hardest part about being in church, is being a hospital. Because see, what's a hospital do? They get you well, but do you stay? No, you leave. Churches are hospitals, and the people that come in are used to coming in with wounds and injuries to themselves. And then when they get all better, well, I'm out of here. See you later. And they might never come back. And it's hard on churches because we open ourselves up to these people. We get to know these people. We get to love these people. And then they're like, well, I'm out of here now. Thank you very much for the help. I'm gone. We're like, wait a minute. That's a hole. That hurts. But that's what we're called to be. A hospital. Today we're going to talk about love. And for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about love. Now, Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, talks about love. Paul gives us a historical view, a, a diagram of what love is. Love is this, love is that, love is this, and love is this. Now I'm going to let you read that for yourselves. It starts in verse 4, but I want to put that up there today. I want you guys to kind of, if you've not read that, go in and read that for yourselves. It's important. Because you cannot have love in your life until you understand all the facets of love. But what I want to really focus on is what Paul focuses on. He reminds his believers, he reminds his readers, those who are following him, that in verse 13, and now these three remain, for the Christian, these three remain in your life, and they should be the staples of your life, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now, have you ever asked yourself why that is? Why is love the greatest of those three? Because faith in Christ, I would think, would be number one. Because you can't have Christ in your life, you can't accept his forgiveness, and you can't accept that there's a new life for you if you don't have that faith. And you can't go to Christ and be honest 
where people, if you don't have hope, that what you know in your heart and what you read in the Word of God is true. So why is love so much bigger and so much more important for us to have? Well, it's simple. When you look at faith, that's a personal thing. I can talk to you about my faith, but I can't give you faith. I can't walk up and say, here's faith. Take it. I can't do that. You have to read it for yourselves, and you have to accept it for yourself. And your faith is going to be a little different than mine sometimes. It's different for all of us because we all have different ways that we've seen Christ and accepted him. Now the hope, I can't give you hope. I can present my hope. I can present what hope is. And I can tell you what hope will be for you. But you have to accept that on your own. You have to develop that hope for yourself. It's a story that you have to write for yourself. So those two things are individual and personal. What I can give is love. I can do love. I can give love. I can share love in a very physical way. I can do things for you. I can talk to you about things. I can do other things that give love out. And that's why Paul says, if you don't have love, you ain't got it. You ain't got Christ at all. You ain't you aren't connected. Yeah, you might have faith and you might have hope, but you need love. And that's the number one thing in every Christian that we need is love. If we don't have love, we're done. Because we're not going to do anything for him. We can't go out to the lost and we can't talk to our brothers and sisters. We can't do things to our brothers and sisters because we don't have love for them. So we can care less about their feelings. We can care less about what they're hurting in, what they're joyful in, what the world's doing. We can care less about it. Because it doesn't matter. We don't have love. Today we're going to look at a love story. And we're going to learn our first three ways we can show love to our brothers and sisters and to the lost. Our love story starts place in Esther. Now I'm sure all of you know Esther. Wonderful girl. Gets chosen to be queen. Didn't have a choice. She was drug out of her house and said, here you go. The king needs a queen. Of course, he got upset with his last queen. She didn't throw a banquet appropriately enough for him. So he's like, well, you're out of here. Which shows that he probably really didn't have a great love for her anyway. But with Esther, when he meets Esther, and when he talks with Esther, and when he listens to Esther, he falls in love with Esther. And we're going to read why we know this. So Esther gets word that Haman, the right-hand man of God, the right-hand man of Xerxes, I'm sorry, jumping ahead of myself again, the right-hand man of Xerxes, who is king of the area right now, the head honcho. This guy's been with him through it all. And now he hates the Jews and wants to annihilate them. And of course, anything he says, Xerxes is like, well, okay, whatever, I'm a busy man, I trust you, go ahead, do whatever it is, and he half listens to him. He never fully gives his full attention to Haman. So Haman takes advantage of it, and Haman makes an edict, and he says, we're going to wipe out the Jews. They're enemies to King Xerxes. Everyone come together and let's kill them all. Esther hears about it. And she prays to God for three days to give her an answer what to do about this. She's in a position to do something, and she prays to God, and God gives her the answer. So on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her, the golden scepter was in his hand. King Xerxes is busy. He's working. He's got things going on. He's got a lot in his head. And he looks up, and there's the love of his life. There's his bride standing in the outer area, waiting for an audience. Now, his other queen never did that. Her, his other queen was kind of off to herself, doing her own thing all the time. But here is his wife. And she is in his work area. And she wants to be a part of this. And he's excited. He's like, whoa, there's my bride. She wants to be a part of my ministry here. She wants to be a part of my kingdom. She wants to be part of my reign. She wants to be with me. This is awesome. Come on in, my queen. Come on in. You have audience with your husband. Let's talk. Then he says, so as Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter, then the king asked her, 
What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half my kingdom, I will be given to you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet and I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that they may do what Esther asked. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom. It will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, if it pleases the king to grant me my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet. I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Look at this scenario. The king is busy. We all know work. We all know like time schedules. We all know what burdened down by events going on and we really don't have time to just go blow off anything we're doing. Especially if you've been in the workforce. You just can't get up and leave your job. It's important that you stay there. You have a job to do. But the king, when he sees his queen, and she says, I would like to have a lunch with you. And I've already prepared it. He says, whoa, stop the press, stop everything right now. Go get Haman immediately. I'm dropping court. There's nothing more important than this. I'm going to go hang with my queen. She's invited me to lunch. We're doing this. There's no second guesses here. He doesn't even question it. He just stops. Dead. No, let's go. I'm hearing my queen say something to me, and I'm responding to what her requests are. Now, I like that he says, I can offer you half my kingdom. Because that tells us something about that time period. That king Xerxes, he only owns half the kingdom. He shares it with other lesser kings. But what he's willing to do for her is give up everything he owns in possession and makes money off of and give it to her. He's willing to give everything he has over to her and say, here you go. I can give you what I have. I can't give you what these other kings own. That wouldn't be right. But I'm willing to give you everything I own. You're that important to me. You're that special to me. I love you. And then he gets up and goes and eats lunch with her. And he's eating lunch with her. And he says, look. Okay, now, will you, will you communicate to me what's going on here? Will you, will you tell me what you need? I'm serious. Anything. Even half my kingdom. Anything you want that I can give you, it's yours. Just name it. And she says, well, if you truly love me, if you truly, truly love me, then you'll come back tomorrow for lunch again. And so Xerxes listens and hears her plea and he moves without question. So then we go on to chapter 7, verse 1 through 7. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet, and as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked Queen Esther, what is your petition? It's driving him crazy. He wants to make her happy. He wants to give her her desires. But she's not opening up yet. So he's like, come on, tell me. It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half my kingdom, I will be, it will be granted. Then Queen Anne, Esther answered, I have found favor with you, my, your majesty. And if it pleases you, grant me my life. Put yourself in King Xerxes' hands for the moment. Put yourself in his mind. He's drinking. He's happy. He's thinking she wants some camels. She wants some more servants. She wants her house painted a certain color. She wants something elaborate. And in nowhere in his mind does he suspect this coming. This is a blow beyond belief. And she says, grant me my life. In his mind, I'm thinking, he's running through, whoa, 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 whoa. What did I do? Why, why, what did we, we're connected here. What happened? What do you mean? I'm not mad at you. You didn't do anything to upset me. He's running through all the things in his head that what she's talking about. But he didn't open his mouth yet. This is my petition. And spare my people, this is my request. Now he's really rolling through his head like, whoa. Excuse me? What's going on here? He's speechless. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify destroying the king. She's 
kind of playing into who he is. He's King Xerxes. He's the ultimate word. And she says, look, I understand. You're the big guy, and I'm not worthy of that. Yeah, I know you love me, but there's still a distance between us. If we were going to be sold to slaves, man, I'd have kept my mouth shut because, you know, kingdoms need slaves. But we're going to be annihilated. Even myself. King, my husband, this is my plea and this is my request. Please answer it. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, pretty much instantly after he heard this, who is he? Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Talk about getting riled. You know, there's one thing to love someone, and there's one th another thing to give your life for someone. King Xerxes is right here on that line right now. He's saying, look, I love you, and I'm willing to give you my life. You tell me who has done this. If it's a king in another country, we'll go to war right now. I'll leave the charge. If it's someone in another area that I don't even know, you tell me right now. I don't care how big their army is. We're going to lead the charge, and I'm going to own them for you. They are going to do this. Tell me who this is. Who is this enemy that I have not heard about? Who has threatened your life that I, King Xerxes, the all-knowing, does not know about? Esther said, an adversary and an enemy. This vile Haman. She points at Haman and says, this is the guy. He's the one. <clears throat> then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. And the king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. King Xerxes gets the answer to his questions. What is your petition? What is your request? Who is going to do this? Who has threatened you? The whole time he hears this, there's Haman. He has been with King Xerxes since King Xerxes' reign began. This is King Xerxes' right-hand man. I would go, okay, wait a minute, stop the train. What, whoa, whoa, what are we talking about here? Um, Haman? <coughs> Queen, Queen Esther, we've only been around for a short time here. Are you sure you know what you're talking about? Are you positive you know what you're talking about? Where is your evidence? I need some proof. Because I trust Haman. Where is your proof in all this? But that's not what Xerxes does. Xerxes doesn't do that. He stands up in a rage. He's mad. He's angry. And he goes out into a garden. Now he goes out into the garden to collect his thoughts. So he just doesn't blow off the handle. Because he is the king. And a king cannot be given just over to any whim. He has to be concise because everything he says is recorded and it's law. So if you can imagine everything you say, someone's writing down, and anything that sounds like an edict or a command or a ruling or a judgment, it's instant and it's, it's there and you can't take it back. That's King Xerxes. So he's hot-tempered, fired mad. He's wanting to just do something, in, but he has to calm down. He looks at Esther and nods and walks out. He's out in the garden, and there is Haman. He knows, oh, I'm a dead man. There's no questions asked. He knows his fate is sealed. He has messed up by messing with the queen's people, but to his defense, he didn't know that's who she was. It was hidden. So he's like, oh, I'm done. So if you know the rest of this part of the story, he begs the queen, grabs her legs, and is like, please, 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 talk to your husband. Don't let him kill me. The king comes in and says, really? Really? You're going to mess with my wife right here in my presence? Oh, you're a smart dude. And before he can make an edict, one of his servants in the room says, oh, by the way, Haman has a hangsman in his yard. Why don't you, king, just a suggestion, take Haman and hang him on it? Just a suggestion. The king's like, I like what you have to say. Make it so. And that takes us to the next part. In chapter 8, 3 through 8, Haman's dead. But the edict is still alive. The edict is still going to happen. The people 
of God are going to be annihilated. And there's nothing Xerxes can do about it right now. Because he signed an edict without knowing what he was signing, without focusing on what he was signing, without even caring what he was signing, he was just signing his name away. And now his wife, the love of his life, her life could be taken and his hands are tied. So, he's on his throne, he's thinking about it, he's trying to figure out what's going to be done. And Esther again approaches. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the golden scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. Now, that doesn't seem like any big deal, right? We have to understand their court system. If the king does not extend the scepter to you, you are automatically to be executed. You cannot come into the king's private chamber of where he calls out commands and edicts and signs papers. You can't come to him. You have to stand on the outer area and let him bring you in. She just comes running in, falls at his feet, and she's crying and she's weeping because she knows that any day now her people are dead. Her family's gone. She has nothing. And the king looks at her and he, he doesn't even get a chance to call her in. And he's shocked. He's like, oh no. Oh, I can do this. Puts the step out to her. Before anyone can kill her, he goes, nope, she's good. She's my queen. Don't you dare touch her. Don't even. She can break any rules she wants and I'll make it right because I'm the king. And so that's what he does. She stood before him. And if it pleases the king, she said, if he regards me with favor or if he truly loves me and thinks it right thing to do, and if it pleases, if it pleases with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatch that Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, devised, and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? And I'm sure King Xerxes broke down. Because he's feeling for his wife. He knows what disaster is. He's seen it. He's created it for so many nations. He's brought nations down. King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, who was her uncle and who was staying, or cousin, and who was standing there in the courtroom with her, because Haman attacked the Jews. I have given his estate to Esther. He proclaims to the courtroom, Haman's estate is now hers. But that's not good enough. So, and it said, and they have impaled or hung him, depending on your version, on a pole he set up. Now write another decree in the king's name behalf of the Jews, as seems best to you. And seal with the king's signet ring for no document written in the king's name and seal with the ring can be revoked. He looks at Queen Esther and he looks at Mordecai and he says, look, this is all this is on you guys to do. You two go out and you write an edict. I don't need to see it. I don't want to see it. I trust you completely to write something out that will save your people. You do this. I'm not going to care what it affects my kingdom in any way, shape, or form. You go ahead and write it. And then you take my ring and you seal it. And what you say will be my word and I'll make it happen. I got your back. Because I love you. I trust you. And I'm, I've got your back. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about the consequences that might happen on this issue. Because I'm going to take care of it. No matter what happens. Xerxes just like gives away his throne to her and says, here you go. She could write anything on that. She could say, King Xerxes can no longer be king. He's making me king. She could have wrote that and sealed it and he had to get with it. He loved her and gave her everything. He listened to her. The Apostle James says this in James 1.19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. You, know, you can read your Bible, but there's things you need to note in your Bible. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Here are our first three of the ten ways to show love. First one is listening. Listening without interrupting. Now, if you're a fixer like me, it's hard to listen to people without wanting to fix the problem almost instantly. And if you're a fixer like me, you know what I'm talking about. Because if someone starts talking to you, a problem, you're already formulating 
Three ways to fix that problem that they're talking about. Now, I've learned through life and I've learned through my marriage that that's not always a good thing. Listening is important. Fixing comes later if fixing needs done. I've had youth come to me and want to cry and, and, and complain that this boy did this or this girl did this and it wasn't fair. I'm like, you know what, we can fix this. Well, oh, wait, wait a minute, Ron, I didn't want it fixed. I don't want you to do anything. I, I, it's kind of already done. I just wanted to cry about it. I wanted to let someone else know how I was feeling. I'm like, oh, so you're going to leave her or you're going to leave him. You don't want to date her. No, 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 we're dating again. I'm lost. What? All they want to do is come in my office and tell me that they were having an argument with their girlfriend or their boyfriend and how upset they were and how they just didn't know if they wanted to be around them anymore. They didn't want me to go in and say, sit down, we're going to talk about this, you two are divided now, have a nice day. Still be friends, but no, no, that's not what they wanted. Listening without interrupting is the first way we show someone that we care about them, that we love them. This is what God does for us. When we talk to God, does he ever interrupt us while we're going off on it? God, this is what's going on. And God, this is what's going on. And God, this is what's going on. God says, whoa, 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 stop a minute. Do you realize someone's over here has worse problems than you? So I'm going to interrupt you for a moment and put you on hold while I listen to them over here. That's not what he does. That's not what Jesus did when people came to him. Jesus didn't put people off. He said, nope. I'm going to listen to you. Go ahead. Talk. I'm listening. So the first thing is, listen without interruption. We should be listening to what they say and what they're not saying. <clears throat> we have to give ear to it. Now, if all they want to do is talk to you and say, thank you for listening, you've done everything you need to do in this point. But there's two more things you need to do if they go on with, now what do you think? What should I do? How should I handle this? Because now they've moved past just, I just want you to listen. So now I need some advice. I need some help. So the first thing you go to after listening without interrupting them, which is hard, is speaking without accusing. When we speak, when we talk to someone who has come to us and said, look, I need you to listen to a problem I'm having. And now I would like some help with this. Quick things we do in our marriages and with family and with friends is like, you know, How'd you get into this situation? How did this even develop? Why are you in this situation? Why are you bringing this to me? What is going on? Why, why, why you? We throw accusations out whether we mean to or not. We might be just, we're just trying to find out more detail that might be needed. But it looks like we're accusing. So we have to be able to speak without accusing. We have to speak with a pleasantness. We have to speak with a calmness. We have to speak with a love in our voice without putting out accusational questions. Now, my wife tells me a lot this. Ron, it's not what you say. It's how you say it and how you look when you say it. I am a very anim animated person. When I talk and when I get into things, my face does things I don't even realize it does. I don't look at myself in the mirror when I talk. I don't. I mean, I, it's just, I, I just talk, and I'm animated. I can't help it. It's who I am. It's how God made me. But other people look at that and go, ooh, you just gave me the stink eye. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Well, I'm sorry if I did. Or my voice gets raised because I get excited. And people look at that and go, oh, you're yelling at me. I didn't. Oh, now you're being condescending. Oh, no, 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 back this way. Oh, now you want to argue? No, 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 stop, 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 stop. So it's hard, isn't it? When someone comes to us and wants us to listen, don't we want to just go, hmm, okay. Instead, we just kind of have to listen. Pleasant face, a light smile, but not too big of a smile. Because then you, you think they make the canary, and you're like, mm -hmm, you're busted. Yes, you are. You're busted. I know this. I got a secret on you. That's not how we do. We speak without accusing. We stay calm. We don't ask questions, how could you or why would you? And then the next thing takes us to our third way to show love in this communications. Because this one is all about communicating love. 
It is answer without arguing. That's a hard one. You want to give an answer. But sometimes the answers we give are argumentative, aren't they? We give answers that, well, you know, this is what you know you should have done. Well, that's starting up an argument right now. We have to give the answers like this. And in the Sunday school class, they kind of want to quote me. Michelle was like, can we quote you on that one? I'm like, no, that wasn't a quote. That was just kind of an outward blurb about someone being grumpy and how to dress them. This, Michelle, is quotes. You can quote me on it. When they ask you your opinion, when they ask you what you think, when they ask you what should I do, here's what you tell them. I will tell you how Jesus would answer me. Let me tell you how Jesus would answer me if I asked him that question. But to do that, you better know Jesus. You better know what he does, how he thinks. So you've got to know all the stories about Jesus, all the writings about Jesus, but once you know who Jesus is, and you should know who Jesus is, because he is your Savior, you can say, well, if I walked up to Jesus right now and asked him this question, I am confident this is what he would give back to me in advice. And Jesus never gave argumentative advice. He just straight up told you, this is what you need. And you can take it or leave it, but this is what you need. This is what you need to do. But he did it with love. Or, here's one I really like when the kids would come to you scenarios, what, to, what ifs. I would say, you know, quote me on this, I don't have a good answer to help you right now. At this moment, I don't know. But, if you give me some time to pray on it, and to think on it, and allow God to talk to me, I will get back with you. Is that okay? You don't specify, specify the time, you just say, when God gives you what you said, you will come back to that. Because now you're letting them know you're connected with God, and God is love. It's not about you and them. It's about them and God. And you're just an emissary. You're an ambassador. That's all you are. That's who Christ says we are. We're his ambassadors. So that's the way we can communicate to those who have questions, who want to come to us with problems after we listen to it, and they want a decision. Now, if you're married, this really applies to you. Or if you have a brother or sister, this applies to you. You look at the person and say, you're absolutely right. When they are right, that is. You say, you're absolutely right. I blanked my sorry, my bad. I am truly sorry for causing this situation when you did cause it. See, that's, that deflects all arguments from your sibling or your spouse instantly. Because you've let them know, I hear you. And you're right. I did that. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. What can we what can we do right now to make this better? How can we fix this? How can we heal this? That way you're not accusing them. You're not putting out there that, yeah, you're at fault. No, 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 no. You're taking responsibility. And you're letting your spouse, you're letting your family know you want to bring that back and make it better and not do that again. You can even go far as say, you know what? As a youth leader, in the youth ministry, I had youth coaches that would come to me, Ron, this isn't working. This isn't working. You told us this would work. You told us this was going to happen and this was going to be great. But everything you brought so far, well, it's kind of flopping like a dead fish on this beach. So, would you listen to my suggestion? Because I might have an idea that might work. I know you're the youth minister. We're supposed to do everything you say. But I might have a better idea. You know, a lot of ministers, a lot of leaders in every business around the world would look at that person and say, just shake your mouth and go back. But the correct answer would be, you know, you might be on to something. You might be on to something. So let's try your way out, because your way might be the better way after all. I hear you. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to speak up of you. I'm not going to talk to you like you're lesser than me. I hear you. You're coming through. Let's try your way. It might be the better way. Maybe God has given you something that he hasn't given to me. I'm going to trust you. Let's try it. Those are the three ways that we show we have love for each other. 
Those are the ways, the three ways we can communicate love to us here and those out there, to those in our family, to those in our personal families. That's what we're called to do. The greatest of these is love. So if we can't listen and talk and give advice without arguing, without raising our voices, without looking silly and trying to jump the gun, then we have no love. There's nothing in us that says love if we can't do those three things. So that's what we need to do. You know, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. At this time, I'm going to offer an invitation. He's listening. He's listening to what you have to say to him. And when he's going to speak to you, it's not going to be harsh. It's going to say, I know. I know. You're not alone in this. Millions of people have done that. All you've got to do is come back and accept me. That's what he's saying to us. He's listening to us. He's speaking softly to us. And he's not arguing. He's saying, I know. I don't want to argue about this. Just come back home. Come to me and I will give you peace. I will give you rest. As we stand and sing our hymn.